أحمده وأصلي على رسول الكريم فقال عز وجل إنا أنزلناه في ليلة القدر رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب The title of my talk today is going to be The Secrets of Ramadan and How to Attain Them It's a strange thing that there's so many things in our deen that are so important but Allah has hidden them. I'll give you a few examples. Ismul A'azm, the highest name of Allah. If you get to know it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will answer your prayers. Allah has hidden it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in on the day of Friday there is a moment where du'as are mustajab but Allah has hid it and there's so many examples in our deen of things that are of significance extreme significance but Allah has hidden it Laylatul Qadr is also hidden. No one knows exactly which day it is. Majority of the ulama, they say it's in the last 10 days of Ramadan, but then there are those ulama that say it's even outside Ramadan. There are even some scholars who say it's in the night of the battle of Badr, Yawm al Furqan. What is the secret of having secrets and having quests to get to know those secrets. But before I go there, I want to share with you something from the Quran. There are four surahs. In Jummah, I talked about the connection between how many surahs? In two or three, yes. Three surahs. Right now, I want to talk about the connection between four surahs. First, in Surah Al-Teen, Allah discusses where the Qur'an and where the revelation was revealed. وَالتِّينِ وَزَيْتُونِ وَتُورِ سِنِينَ وَهَذَا الْبَلَدِ الْأَمِينَ And then after discussing the places of where revelation has come. Then in the next surah, which is what? Suratul. After Surah Al-Teen is Suratul Ala. Allah mentions what was revealed to the last Nabi Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then after Surah Al-Ala is Surah what? Qadr. Then Allah tells you when it was revealed. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. And the climax of this, the climax, is Surah Al Bayyina, which comes after, which is Nabi Muhammad and the Quran. When the two come together, what does it mean? Why was this done? Why this place? Why this time? Why these verses? And in Surah Al Bayyina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, Lam yakuni ladina kafaru min ahlil kitab wal mushrikina munfakina hatta ta'tiyahum al Bayyina. No one's going to believe of the pagans or the people of the book until they have absolutely clear evidence this is the truth. What is the clear evidence that this is the absolute truth? The evidence is Rasulun min Allah, a messenger from Allah, who demonstrates to you the divine teachings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rasulun min Allah yatlu suhufan mutahara, and he reads to you from the purified pages 
that are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi kitab maknun la yumassu illa al-mutahharun. So these four surahs are extremely important in understanding the wisdom of sending a messenger, which this is not the subject. Why Allah sent a messenger and why Allah sent a book. One of the common themes between the four surahs in Surah Al-Teen, Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ When Allah is talking about where Allah sent His revelation, Allah talks about that man has great potential. Look at these people who reached the peak of human potential. Prophet Musa, Prophet Isa, and of course Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ ثُمَّ رَدَدْنَاهُ أَسْفَلَ سَافِلِينَ And in the next surah, when Allah discusses the five verses of the Qur'an that were revealed to Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah then immediately proceeds to talk about Abu Jahl who was stopping Prophet Muhammad from praying and from doing his responsibilities as a Nabi Sallallahu And then in Surah Al-Bayyina Allah makes the same point that there are two groups of people. Surah Al-Teen, two groups of people. Surah Al-Alaq, two groups of people. Ara'ahu staghna inna ila rabbika huja'a. And Surah Al-Qadr comes now to tell you which night. Now what I want to share with you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the word Laylatul Qadr in Surah Al-Qadr how many times? How many times? Three times. How many times did Allah say Laylatul Qadr? Three times. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, he says, Laylatul Qadr is nine letters. How many? Nine letters. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, he says, these nine letters are repeated, Laylatul Qadr are repeated how many times? Three times. So he concluded from there that Laylatul Qadr is on the 27th of Ramadan from this. That is an opinion of a companion of Prophet Muhammad Secrets. Attaining secrets is important. How do you attain secrets? Khidr. Alayhi salatu wassalam teaches us how to attain secrets. You attain secrets not by questioning, like Musa alayhi salatu wassalam was trying to do. No. You don't get secrets by what? Questioning. You get secrets by experiencing. By what? Let me give you an example. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said that when someone does iftar and he's a true mu'min and he had sincerity in his iftar in his fasting he had sincerity what will happen to his face he will what what will he do anybody remember what will a true believer do when he's opening his iftar he will smile yes Prophet Muhammad said this, he will have surur, he will be smiling. What is the secret of that? You can't know that till you experience that. Huh? When Khidr said to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, La tas'alni an shay, don't ask me about anything. I will tell you at the end. Humanity today, this is one of the reasons Ramadan is so great. 
if you are in touch with yourself. Because humanity today is always thinking rationally, thinking and thinking. And in all the thinking, we're never trying to experience. Did you understand what I just said? In thinking too much, when you think, overthink, you lose the experience. Because when you're overthinking, you're not in the moment. But to know spiritual experiences, you must be in the moment. You must experience the truth. It is not wrong to rationalize, no. I am only saying that there is a form of knowledge you cannot have. There is an insight, a spiritual insight you cannot have unless you experience that thing in itself. <coughs> So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. Indeed, we, meaning Allah, we sent this Quran down on the night of what? Laylatul Qadr. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anh, he says something else in rationalizing his opinion on the 27th. That's the ijtihad of a sahabi, Khibrul Ummah. He says the Surah Al-Qadr has how many words? 30 words. And the word hiya, hiya means it is, is the 27th letter of Surah Al-Qadr. So the Sahaba, they were looking for secrets. So the Sahaba were what? Looking for secrets. Looking for something the Prophet did not tell us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna anzalnahu. Indeed, we sent this Quran on what? Laylatul Qadr. Did Allah send this Quran? Tell me. From what you know, did Allah send this Quran? Or did Jibreel bring this Quran? Which one? Allah mentions the Laylatul Qadr, making his nisbah, his connection to it directly to himself to explain to you how important this night is. Without mentioning Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hides the word Quran and instead he says it. Inna anzalna hu. We sent it. Did the listeners at the time of the Prophet know what is it? Because when you say it, you don't use the ma'ir unless the audience already knows what you are what? You don't use pronouns. I don't say he unless the audience already knows what he or it or she what? What it is. So, inna anzalnahu. But the other reason why you don't mention something and you just mention it in hishara, in just in a sign towards it, is to explain the greatness of something. Inna anzalnahu. That we, Allah mentions that we said this without mentioning Quran as a way of showing how great it is. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. We sent down this Qur'an on Laylatul Qadr. Qadr generally has three meanings. One meaning of Qadr is the word that I'm talking about, Ashraf, how valuable something is. On this great night that changed history after that. Inna anzalnahu fi Laylatul Qadr. The second meaning of Qadr is restricted, that there's so many angels because it's the earth becomes restricted in terms of space. Imagine yourself in a small room with hundreds of people, there's no space. And then if you do tafsir Quran, you fasilu ba'duha bi ba'd, you fasil tafsir of Quran ba'duha bi ba'd. Then if you take the ayat of Sutud Dukhan, Anzalnahu Laylat al Mubarakan. Yufraqul fiha min kulli amr. Over there is qadr in qadr of amr. 
of the commands, the qadr, the destinies of the people. So there is great secrets in the month of Ramadan. One of the greatest secrets is the night of qadr. And the night of qadr itself is very important. The night of qadr itself was extremely important night even before the revelation of Qur'an. Because Allah says, Laylatan Mubaraka. This night that was blessed, in which we sent down the command, in which we were sending down the command. So in this night that was already blessed, that there are indications of, even in the Bible of Laylatul Qadr, and there are indications of Laylatul Qadr with other prophets. In this blessed night, then Allah decides to bring down the final revelation on this blessed night. So the Qur'an comes down, it's like a great night with a great event. The great night was already great, and the great event is the Qur'an is coming down to humanity. And over here I want to show you one link because there's not that much time. That when there is Qadr, before there is Qadr, there must be something else. Just to show you the links. Allah says in Surah Al-A'la, سَبِّحْ إِسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى الَّذِي خَلَقَ فَسَوَّى وَالَّذِي قَدَّرَ فَهَدَى When you have created something, when Allah has created something, it must have Qadr with it. Yes? If Allah created something, its destiny must be with it. Yes? Sabbih isma rabbika al-a'la al-ladhi khalaqa fasawwa wal-ladhi qaddara fahada. In Surah Al-Alaq, Allah says, Ikra' bismi rabbika al-ladhi khalaq. Over here, inna anzalnahu fi laylatil qadr. Because what has takhniq must have takdeer. إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ بِقَدْرِ We created it with qadr, with measurement. So Allah created us and He fixed our destinies. And He fixed our destinies, as I was mentioning in Jum'ah, He fixed our destinies with the Qur'an, which is Ummul Kitab. Our destinies are where in Lahul? Our destinies are where? In Lahul Mahfuz. Yes? And the Quran is Bal huwa Quran Majeed fi Lawhin Mahfuz. It is Ummul Kitab. It's the mother of all the books by which all the other registers will be judged. Ikra Kitab. You'll either be given the book on your right or your left or behind your back. Who will be given the book behind their back? Those people who were the custodians of the book of Allah and they threw the book of Allah behind their backs. Kitab Allahi wa ra'a dhuhurihim. They threw the books of Allah behind their backs. Ka'annahum la ya'lamun. As if they never knew the book of Allah existed. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, don't make the Quran your pillow. Don't make it into a pillow. So the month of Ramadan has come. How do we experience, how can we get, an ex not the mechanical movements of Ramadan, but how can we get the secrets of Ramadan? How can we get the experience of Ramadan? And for that, I have the following points to make. What are the priorities of Ramadan? The Quran makes this very clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, first point. So I have four points on this issue. Let's see how much time I have. Okay, I have a little bit of time. Four points about Ramadan. The how you can go above the mechanical process into an experiential process. Where you're just not a robot in the month of Ramadan. First, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and by the way, before I mention this point, I'll tell you, fasting is a form of self-mastery. Fasting is a what? Anyone that can fast for 30 days, I'm not saying this, not me, no. You know in counseling, in counseling now, what's one of the big things now? I'll tell you about one counselor, what he does. One counselor, he tells people, before you start your fast, take a picture. And after you're done, you're fasting five days, ten days, whatever, take a picture of yourself. And see for yourself how much you have changed. And Muslims do it every, day, every year for 30 days. In counseling for well-being, one of the new things that they discuss with their patients and their clients, one of the new things that's being discussed is, what about doing intermittent fasting? You probably all heard of the term intermittent fast. fast. Why don't you try that? Because when people are able to fast, when people are able to fast, they see that they have control over themselves. You see somebody who's stuck doing drugs, somebody who's stuck in an addiction, they begin to feel helpless at a sub subconscious level. They feel defeated that this little thing is defeating me. I'm helpless. And a lot of diseases, or, or you could say health problems, related to food, like anorexia. You know why people throw up what they eat? Because they don't feel in control. What fasting gives you and me? What fasting gives you and what? Me. Imagine the Sahaba for a second. Not people like us that have been fasting mechanically. Imagine the first generation that starts to fast. And the atmosphere of Ramadan transforms a person. Can you imagine that companion of the Prophet thinking to himself, wait, I can really do this. I can really pray all the time. I can really read Quran all the time. That is an experience. That is self-discovery. That is the beginning of self-mastery. The fact that you can fast for 30 days means that Allah has already equipped you with self-mastery. And one of the biggest problems with the modern age is that we are taught fatalism, that we can't change. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, going back to these four surahs, Allah says, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ what? Your default is self-mastery. Your default is what? Your default is self-mastery. But you have convinced yourself, I can't do it. I can't do it. No, it's not that you can't do it. Face reality. It's that you don't want to do it. There is nothing that if you want to do, you cannot do. That's one of the things that you learn from fasting. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kutiba alaykum sayyam Fasting has been ordained for you. Kama kutiba ala ladhina min qablikum Like it was ordained for the people before. La'allakum what? Tattakun. What is tattakun? The ability to have self-mastery. The ability to control yourself. The ability to protect yourself going in the wrong direction. Every single person has that ability. The only thing is that shaitan whispers you in the mind in the other months telling you you can't what? That's the difference between inside Ramadan and outside Ramadan. Inside Ramadan, those whispers are weak. Shaitan's still there, but the whispers are what? Weak. He's shackled. Not shackled as in he can't do what he does, but he's shackled. That's a different discussion I'll have one day. But he's shackled. And so his whispers are not strong, and therefore you're able to do what you want to do. 
you become a transformed person because you believe in yourself more than when you're outside Ramadan where you believe in the whispers that are put inside your head. Allah has created us to be have self-mastery. That's what purification of the soul is all about. It is about self-mastery. So the first thing after you convince yourself this is what you have to do. I'm talking to the young kids here. You have to ask yourself, what is it that I'm willing to do in Ramadan that I'm not willing to do? What is it that I'm really willing to give up? If you're not willing to give up anything, then you're not serious about Ramadan and you don't want to change. If you want to fast and just be hungry and then come to Trawi and just do the rituals, or do you really want to transform yourself to your best self? That's the first question you have to, because you can't change a person who doesn't want to what? If you don't want to change, it doesn't matter what it is. You could go to Hajj, you can go to Ramadan, it's not going to change you. But if you want to change, then you have to decide what you want to change. What will you change about yourself? And then the Quran says, Shahr Ramadan الذي أنزل فيه القرآن You must, you must, you must read the entire Quran in the month of Ramadan. You must read Quran at the exact same time, in the exact same place, every single day for the month of Ramadan. And then try to see if you can continue. Second thing Allah, third thing Allah says, which is a hidden gem within the Quran about Ramadan. Because Laylatul Qadr is about having a night where you can change your destiny, yes? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the end about Ramadan, Allah ends with this piece of words. When my servant asks you of me, I am so near you. Dua in Ramadan is extremely important with reading Quran. Dua and Quran go together in Quran. Dua and Quran. Because Quran is Ummul Kitab, the mother of the book of what? Lohul Mahfuz. It has your destiny in it, your, your qadr, your register. Your, your, your destiny is umul, in, in Lohul Mahfuz. You read Quran, the mother book, and then you do what? Dua. That will change destinies. If you read Quran and do dua, and you try your best to be the best of yourself, and you believe in yourself that Allah has created me, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ Allah has created me better, Allah has created me to be better than what I am. Allah has what? Created me to be better, not be as in intrinsically, but to act better, to behave better, to have more of a prophetic character, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that Allah has opened all the doors for me. But the only thing stopping me from being a better person is who? Is me. Me and my saying to myself, I can't do it. If you can stop seeing dirty things, five minutes, okay. If you can stop seeing dirty things for the month of Ramadan, you can do it outside Ramadan. If you can read Quran every day in the month of Ramadan, you can do it outside Ramadan. But what is the secret of it all? The secret to be able to have self-mastery is control of the tongue. Is control of? If you spend your time just talking 
It's all about what goes in and out of you. Your input and output. If you're able to control your tongue and stay serious and stay focused and not be distracted and not get bored, you know what is the reason we get bored? You think if you read Quran, you'll be bored, right? You think that if you pray too much, you'll be bored, right? This is what we think. But the thing that's closest psychologically to boredom is self-loathe, self-loathing. You know what self-loathing is? Disliking yourself. You're bored of yourself. You prayed a few a little bit and now you're bored. You don't like what you're doing yourself. So now you need external things to keep you happy. And the last thing Allah mentions, that you must keep your relationships with your family members in Ramadan. So now, what is the point I make? You must have a schedule. You must have what? Schedule. Everyone that's going to make a schedule. I'll tell you a secret or a story. Anybody ever heard of Charles Schwab? Charles Schwab? Has anybody heard of Charles Schwab? Okay. He's an investor, a big investor. Okay. He's an investment company. Charles Schwab hired um, a, business, uh, a business consultant. So Charles Schwab said, okay, I'm starting this business. It's a big investment business. You're a business consultant. What should I do? What do you think I should do? He said, every day write down seven things that you absolutely need to do. And write them down in order. What did he say? Write down seven things you need to do and write them in order. And then he said, that's it. He said, that's it. And just get them done. Okay. He said, how much should I pay you? He said, pay me in three months. Based. If you do this for three months, then pay me in three months. You know how much he paid him? $25,000 for the half an hour conversation. $25,000 for half an hour conversation. What is my point? If you're serious like Charles Schwab is for his dunya, if you're serious like that about your Ramadan, you will write down your schedule. You will write down your priorities. You will write down your du'as. You will write down your schedule. You will make it clear how much Qur'an I'm going to read every day. You're going to make a plan. If I told you that I'll give you a million dollars at 3 o'clock in the morning and you were sleeping, you would make a plan of how you're going to make sure you get here at 3 o'clock in the morning, even if you didn't have a car. So what are my two takeaways? Self-mastery is the human default. And number two, if you're serious about Ramadan, you'll make a schedule. And when you make a schedule, you won't have to rationalize that much. You'll just be in the experience of things. أقول قولي هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم لسان المسلمين والمسلمات السلام عليكم